You're watching Telecom TV from the OpenStack Summit in Berlin. And I'm joined now by Mark Shuttleworth, who's founder and CEO of Canonical. Mark, good to see you again. Thanks for joining us on Telecom TV. Um, we're at another OpenStack Summit. There's been updates announced, there's, there's roadmaps drawn up. Um, we've even got a name change for the next event already announced. How do you see this, this market developing? Well, I think OpenStack is now firmly established as the open infrastructure as a service component. Uh, it's had its ups and downs. I think it's in a much healthier position today because a lot of the kind of uh, 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 shallow bolt-ons effectively that were piggybacking on the buzz um, of OpenStack have fallen away. So what remains um, in OpenStack is a, a, a core that's focused on the core problem which needs solving, which is VMs on demand, disks on demand, networks on demand. And that's actually shaping up very nicely. You've seen a, a lot of vendors fall away. The, the leading vendors remaining are Canonical, Red Hat, um, and I think that's as it should be, right? It, OpenStack is kind of an extension of enterprise Linux effectively. Um, and that's all very healthy. Um, I think the name change, the introduction of the sort of idea of open infrastructure in principle is correct, but I would worry that it might be a distraction away from that sort of core mission um, uh, on, on, on delivering OpenStack in, in good condition. Now, you, you mentioned in your keynote speech this morning that success with OpenStack is all about the OPEX. How, how so? In the end, cloud has done a wonderful thing for IT in that it's, it's put a very clear view of the economics of IT and, and and a competitive view on the economics of IT. And if you go back pre-cloud, every IT department was a little monopoly. And monopolies can get very unhealthy, right? In a cloud world, you've got this wonderful competitive market for VMs, you've got this wonderful competitive market for disks and for other services. So that actually gives us a really clear lens through which we, you know, we can look at IT. And private cloud has to ultimately survive the same scrutiny. Right. If I'm going to get VMs on demand from a private cloud, I want a price for that that is comparable to the price on, on my public cloud. The only difference, of course, is that with private cloud, I get the benefit or the curse of CapEx. Some, right. some workloads, uh, if I know that I'm going to burn them flat out for three years, it would make sense to back them with CapEx. If, I, if I'm going to see them very, very variable, then it would make sense to sort of shift them into a rental type environment like the public cloud. So that's the argument for private cloud, it's CapEx. The problem, of course, is that if you own a private cloud, you have to operate it. And so it's not just CapEx, you've also got this annual cost of running a private cloud. And that can be significant if you do it badly. And so really what I was trying to say is, if you're going to stand up a private cloud, get the CapEx right, but most importantly, get the OpEx right. Think about how you're going to manage that, how you're going to upgrade that, how you're going to scale that, and how you're going to do that cost effectively over many years in a world where, as you saw, there's a lot of change, yeah. right? So that's why we've, um, we've been very successful with managed services, because it essentially allows people to say, okay, I know exactly what my OPEX is going to be. If I stand up a 200 node managed cloud, I know to the dollar what my OPEX will be every single year, because that's a managed contract effectively. Once people have that in a stable configuration and it's working for them, they can then start to say, okay, can I essentially take over the management of that cloud myself? And I can always benchmark how I'm doing against the cost of the managed service. Are we in a multi-cloud world? Uh, we, yeah, yeah, and, and, and this is something that's, that's going to re remain for a foreseeable future? Is it? In this competitive world of public clouds and private clouds, the, the stable position for an enterprise is to have deep relationships with at least two, and probably just two, major public clouds, pick two. Yeah. The, the obvious ones are all good, Yeah. right? Um, there are reasons why you might prefer, you know, they differentiate from each other, they're not all exactly the same, but pick two, so, that, so you have some competition. And then have a private cloud which is very efficiently run. Having a bad private cloud is just like having a bad data center, so don't do that, right? That's why if you get the OPEX right on your private cloud and you have two public clouds, and you engineer your operations so that you're doing everything in all three places. Then you can dynamically dial up and dial down what you do on this public cloud versus that public cloud versus your private cloud. Then you're in a really stable position economically. You can't turn around um, in this environment without coming across the edge, uh, and the network edge and edge computing is, is, is prevalent. Um, what's Canonical doing to support um, edge deployments and developments, and, and how does this affect 
an enterprise, especially a telco's enterprise, as how they approach their cloud management? Well, so first, if you think about the, the, all the different kinds of industries out there, there are some which are entirely digital, right? And they can live just on the public cloud. But there are many other businesses that have physical presence, buildings, um, distribution networks, uh, and they need compute, right? They need to put software in those physical places, right? If you imagine a, a, a shipping warehouse, right? You, you, you need um, devices and cameras and softwares and air conditioning systems and all these different kinds of things that have to happen in that physical location. You probably want to, to, to automate that. You probably want to have the control for that in that physical location as well. Creating little clouds for um, a retail distribution center or a bank branch office or a, um, a telco uh, tower, for example, makes sense because it's a way to essentially manage using cloud methodologies, software that you need to put in that building effectively. So an edge cloud is really just a half rack of servers which, which instead of thinking of as physical appliances, this appliance for the security, that appliance for the air conditioning, you now think of it as a little cloud, and then you can put software on that little cloud to run all of those functions, right? But in characterizing it that way, you see the problem. Um, the, the story is quite different if you're a telco, or if you're a, a, a pharmaceutical company, or if you're a logistics company, right? So what we're doing is we're working with all of those different industries, each of them has a slightly different idea as to how they want to organize that half rack. Some of them want to use Kubernetes, some of them want to use VM, some of them want to use KVM, some of them want to use bare metal, some of them want to use VMware, right? And we don't, we're not going to them with a prescriptive edge solution. We're rather saying, look, here are the raw materials of open source. Here's what you can do with MAS, Metal as a Service, which will do physical provisioning of servers. It can put Windows on them, it can put VMware on them, it can put Linux on them. Uh, here's what you can do with KVM, here's what you can do with Kubernetes. You guys want to figure out how you want to orchestrate those things to get the result that you're looking for. And that's been very successful. We're working with a ton of telcos, financial institutions, and, and kind of retail companies on their edge cloud positions. Given, given the speed at which huge chunks of code can be completely rewritten and over a space of a few years, you know, your, your original code is 50%, 75%, all, all, all new. It's, 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 it's developing so, so fast. Is, is, is OpenStack the end goal? Or is, is this like an interim step and we, it'll well, ever changing? That's slightly misleading, right? So OpenStack itself now is slowing down in terms of its core code, and that's good. Right? It's not like OpenStack is going to get reinvented. Just because the foundation has launched some new projects doesn't mean that we're essentially rewriting the old code. Right? These are new bodies of code that are kind of springing up left and right of, of OpenStack itself. Um, so, so no, there was a rapid rate of change in the early days, and now OpenStack's core is stabilizing and maturing, which is, which is a good thing, effectively. Um, but as new problems get addressed, that those call for new code bases, effectively, and so, so the perception is of, of OpenStack changing, but it's, it's really you know, different code bases popping up left and right of it. Does the uh, CSP sector, telco sector, have specific requirements that are different to other enterprise businesses that, I mean, we talked about um, businesses that have asset bases, physical asset bases as well, but do, do they have requirements that impacts the development of OpenStack? Uh, yes, and that was a slightly painful process a couple of years ago. Um, but now I think OpenStack, the core of OpenStack, has a lot of useful capabilities in it for telcos um, you know, to be able to do very controlled placement of workloads with very defined quality of service primitives. That's, that's now well addressed in the core of OpenStack. I think the challenge for telcos is now moving up into the management and orchestration layer, right? The Mano layer. Um, and there are a number of different initiatives. Um, we are involved with um, uh, Telefonica and VMware and uh, a number of other telcos in something called Open Source Mano, uh, which is run under the auspices of Etsy. And it's actually shaping up very nicely. It's very clean. Um, it's very easy to integrate, right? Which I think is important because every telco OSS BSS is different. And so having something that's well-defined, clean and, and understandable is of course then a lot easier to integrate into a sort of a, a, a diverse set of OSS BSSs. Um, so that's what I like about OSM. But there are also others, there's ONAP, um, and, uh, and then a couple of other research projects as well that are interesting. Do you, do you think that, um, you know, if, if OpenStack is, has become like the de facto standard for, for infrastructure management, we, we, we might see it used more prominently within the, the, the telecoms industry, so, you know, especially in areas like the traditional heartland of, of, of cellular, where they seem to want to kind of reinvent the wheel 
somewhat on, on, on their network side. And, and you think, well, there's the solutions out there now. Surely we should be adapting or using what's already been done. You know, I'm quite impressed with the, with the pace of work in that regard. You know, when you have a really big change, it always seems to take longer to happen than you thought it would and then go faster than you thought it could. You know, it's this, it's this odd dichotomy, right? But I think there are all the signs now of the first wave of this kind of being done. People have made a lot of mistakes, right? They've spent a lot of money. Um, the reality is quietly behind the scenes, the infrastructure has been getting better and better and better. You saw a great demo today from AT&T. Uh, we see you know, excellent work being done in lighthouse telcos all over the world. That looks very compelling. And you see a new generation of, of um, uh, application providers, you know, disruptive VNF providers effectively, that aren't simply taking their old appliance and taking the disk image and publishing it as a VM. They're actually building software that's cloud native for the telco industry. So I'm quite excited about all of that. I think um, you know, it, it has taken a long time, but as it really kicks into gear, I think it'll go faster than people realize. Well, we look forward to seeing developments over the, over the, uh, the months to come. But for now, Mark, thanks for joining us again Great on Telecom to see TV. You again.